near mint condition, the home of collected oh, edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. Hey, hey, all you mentees, Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for your weekly advanced look at the books that are coming out from Marvel Comics this week. So let's go ahead and get started. And welcome back, everybody. So what we have here is a variety of different Collected Editions from Marvel Comics. And don't forget, they also have Omnis coming out this week. Uh, but this is the hardcovers, the epic collections, one being a reprint, a new one, and then a new trade paperback of a series that I have been enjoying. And honestly, I have been looking forward to this one for a long time. And if you want to jump around in the description of the video is where I always put the timestamp so you're not spoiled on anything that you don't want to know anything about or in case you're not interested in a particular book. But before going any further, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. That does let you know when our videos are going live. And big thank you to Marvel and David Gabriel for sending us advanced copies of these books. All right, let's go ahead and start with Ultraman, the mystery of Ultra 7. So kicking off this week is the Ultraman, the mystery of Ultra 7. Now, if you have not read the previous two volumes or don't know anything about Ultraman and Ultra 7, I'm sure the question I'm going to be getting is, is this a good jumping on point? Uh, this is the third series so it's a third trade paperback of these mini series and i think it does a good job of introducing you to the mythos and who ultraman is because you're starting over kind of anew with the character of ultra 7. Uh, minor spoilers for what's happened previously not, not, not going too deep just really quickly what happened in the previous volume is that shin hayata merged with ultraman however he had his essence, or rather his Ultra Force, leached out of him by none other than Dan Moraboshi, who had everyone thought was dead. So Dan Moraboshi is back, but not only is he back, he was able to get the Ultra Force out of Shin. And what happens is that Shin had become Ultraman. And in order for him to become Ultraman, he needs that Ultra Force. So who's going to find the giant Kaiju if it's not going to be Ultraman? Well, this is when we get Ultra 7. Now we get a little bit of a flashback as to not just where Dan Moroboshi has been, but also how he acquired the power of Ultra 7. And what's going on with Shin? I mean, it is called Ultraman, the mystery of Ultra 7. And we know that Shin is just kind of laying low, or rather he's taken out of commission. So he's not dead, uh, but he is back. So in here, you're going to see some fights again with giant kaiju. Because, I mean, that this is based on, of course, the series that came out of Japan. Japan. Which, amazingly enough... Ultra 7 is the series that I grew up with. I think a lot of people uh, that I've talked to that knew about the Ultraman universe learned about it from Ultraman himself. For me, it started with Ultra 7. And, of course, you know, this inspired a lot of other things like Power Rangers and the whole Sentai series. And uh, whenever we're fighting Kaiju, everybody probably, most people probably think of, uh, and whenever we're talking about Kaiju, of course, most people are probably thinking of Godzilla. How could you not? Uh, you get some monsters like that, but it's basically the kind of monsters that you would see on the TV show. And I love that show growing up as a kid. So we do get the fight. Brother against brother. Ultra 7 versus Ultra Man. Dan versus Shin. Who's going to come out on top and what's going to happen? How is, how is Shin even going to get his powers back? And are they going to set their differences aside to go and fight the giant kaiju? And what happens when both of them are seemed, are deemed a threat by the United Science Patrol? Well, that's when Jack comes in. And that's Jack, and you can find out how all that happens by reading this miniseries. I really wish this had continued into an ongoing series, because I really enjoyed this. Uh, the creators behind this is, um, we have Kyle Higgins writing it with Matt Groom, and then you have David Tinto and Espiden. Grudenjern 
as the colorist and David doing the art. But you do have some backup stories by Kyle Higgins and Matt Groom and different artists like David Lopez and Guri Hiru. And I'll show you what that is here in a little bit. Uh, because there is a very important backup story. That's all we'll say about the miniseries. On the character of executive director Morum. There's a little bit of a flashback here. And you kind of get what her intentions are with the USP. Then of course we get the little backup stories. They're one page stories like this. The kaiju steps. And this is the artwork by Goody Hiru. You get the variant covers here. Like the live action ones. And then other variant covers so this collects the ultraman mystery of ultra 7 all five issue miniseries 128 pages and the book retails for 17 dollars and 99 cents that is beautiful and you get some of the classic monsters there from the show too and then these are the other two trade paperbacks the rise of ultraman and then the trials of ultraman so alex ross on the cover there and then arthur adams and beautiful beautiful collection here I hope they continue. Please let me know in the comments down below if you've heard they're continuing this as another mini-series. Because it can definitely keep going. And maybe one day make it an ongoing series. Next up is the latest printing of Daredevil Epic Collection Last Rites. So what we're looking at here is volume 15. The 1990-1992 series. This has been previously printed before. So here it is compared to the first edition, the original printing. This original printing seems to be a little darker on the colors here on the outside, on the cover. Let's look at the back cover. Not so much so on the back cover, but mainly the main cover. Eh, maybe just a little bit darker here on the yellows and the green on the building right there. But definitely here with this looks a little bit lighter pink. But we'll do an internal comparison here in a minute. So this is the latest printing of this book. This one retails, I forgot to mention that, $49.99. The original printing retailing for $39.99. So let's put that book up and focus on this one. And we'll do an internal comparison in just a little bit. So what we have here is Daredevil 283 to 300. And we have the last of the Anacenti run and the beginning of the DG Chichester run and we kick it off with issue 283 so collected in here is Daredevil 283 to 300 and then annual number seven so included in here is the storyline the last rites which is the fall of the kingpin uh, but not before we talk about Anacenti's final issues we have this Captain America issue that's drawn by Mark Bagley uh, very patriotic and then we have this big storyline that goes on through for, for quite a while. And it focuses on the idea in the aftermath of Mephisto, Matt Murdock has amnesia. So now Matt's walking around. He's calling himself Jack Murdock. He has no idea that he's Daredevil. He honestly had no idea that he was blind. So he he's like he actually mentions here that he's blind but not quite blind. And one of the other things that's interesting about this right here is the beginning of the Lee Weeks era. So Anna Cinti got to work with Lee Weeks towards the end of her era. And then we have DG Chichester working with Lee Weeks at the beginning of his era. We also have a fill-in issue uh, through these pages by Greg Capullo, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Now, I mentioned that Matt Murdock doesn't remember being Daredevil. But there is somebody that's going around dressed as Daredevil. And it's up to Matt Murdock and his new friend. Uh, he does meet a young lady, Nyla, to kind of gather the clues and figure out what his past is. And there is this amazing fight later on at towards the end of her run featuring the character of Bullseye versus Daredevil. And it's done in a very unique way. And it's this issue right here that is drawn by Greg Capullo and the inks are by Doug Hazelwood. So this is Greg Capullo before he took over the run on Quasar and then of course eventually went over to X-Force, which we have a lot of his work here in a little bit. So before we get to DG's first issue, we do have the annual right here, the Von Strucker Gambit Part 1. Now this doesn't include the next part. So if you have the Captain America Epic Collection and the Punisher Epic Collections, that's where you're going to find the other two parts. Uh, but part one is in here, so it does continue into the Punisher annual number four. And then we have this really dark story right here that features the character of Ben Urich. This is by Eric Fain and Don Hudson providing the artwork. We have the story here of the Fat Boys. They're back by Gregory Wright. 
and June Brigman. And then we have the first issue of DG Chichester's run, and that is issue 292. Now, what he does with Matt is a little bit different than what Anacinti was doing. He's taking Matt back to the basics. He's bringing in a lot of villains, specifically the Hand, who will play a big role in the next few issues. But not before Tombstone and Taskmaster team up. That means that Daredevil is going to have a team up with, well, not before a misunderstanding, with the Punisher, but also Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider shows up through here. And again, Lee Weeks taking the artwork duties for most of this run. Uh, we have Matt going back to being a lawyer and then of course with Foggy Nelson you can find out exactly how he gets his memory back and does he remember being Daredevil well pretty sure you could probably figure that out but the big thing that happens through here is the return of the hand now all of this is leading into the fall of the kingpin which is a big four-part storyline this is the cover right here by Lee Weeks uh, that starts with issue 297 so after the whole hand storyline he leads directly into the last rites the fall of the kingpin which, to a lot of us, uh, feels like the closure that we needed for Born Again. And what I mean by that is Born Again is a phenomenal story. It's To, to so many people, it's the perfect storyline. But to some of us, not, not a lot of us, some of us, it felt like there was something missing. Like, we didn't get the closure that we needed. And this serves like a closure to it. It kind of brings in the key players back from Born Again. And now we have Typhoid Mary. Uh... That was, the whole Typhoid Mary part, though, I'll just... I will say that's not my favorite part of how Daredevil handled that. Uh, I think Anna Senti's character was handled better during her run. But the rest of it was really interesting to see him, you know, Matt Murdock, trying to take down the Kingpin. And doing it internally and doing it financially. And it's just really interesting to see him doing that because, you know, the Kingpin during this time is entering the media business. And that becomes really important during Chichester's run. And so much so that it plays out in the final two issues of the Fall from uh, the Last Rites. Now, of course, you know, we can't just have the Kingpin be in here. We also have to have the Hydra and the Hand and Baron Von Strucker here. Now, all the way in the back, we do have some extras. We have the articles here um, interviewing Anna Sinti and then Lee Weeks. And they're talking about issue 300 and what her run meant. And then this right here is from the Marvel Illustrated Swimsuit issue. And honestly, I think that's it. That's as far as extras. I'm surprised they didn't collect the trade paperback cover. With the, I think it had an embossed cover. It's the one that I had. It was an old, old cover that I had of fall from our uh, last rights so it's got 504 pages 49 dollars and 99 cents and what i want to do right now is kind of compare it to the original printing this one seems a little bit thicker than the original printing so that is something to keep in mind and as far as the paper oh yeah different paper stock this one feels a lot glossier than the finish that they give it here but this one seems thicker too so let's actually do a little comparison. This is a good page. Page number 19. If you look at the bleed through. So you do have a little bit of bleed through in this original printing. You can see some of the actual sounds, sound effect coming through from the opposite page. Also here too, the word bubbles. Whereas over here, not so much. And that's probably due to the paper stock that they're using here. They're not using a glossy paper. Or it's kind of a semi-glossy finish to it. And it's thicker than the original printing. And what's really interesting is that both of them were printed in the Silisco printer in Canada. And this one is in 2020 and this one in 2021. And as far as the colors, they do seem just a little bit brighter in the new printing compared to the original printing. And that's probably due to the paper stock that they're using. Not so much so the files, but just a little bit darker over here compared to this. A little bit bolder. But that's it. Now, as far as the colors, they do vary from page to page. Sometimes it seems like this is lighter than this over here. This seems a little bit bolder in the original printing. But for example, like if you're looking at the skin tone on Captain America right there, it seems to be just a little bit darker in the new printing as opposed to over here. But that's not the case with every page. I think it's just a page-by-page page comparison. One thing, one thing, and this is in the original comics, by the way. Uh, whenever you're reading the final issues of Anna Senti's run, we do have 
and I think it's in this issue. Yeah, right here, where you see the word bubbles, like the actual line artwork is showing up on top of the lettering. And that happens here, here, and then I think in this page, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right here, where the colors are just kind of bleeding through. Now, it's also found in the original one. So, yeah, so that's found in the original one as well. There it is down here. Yeah. That was found in the original comic, too. All right. Let's talk about these spines. And it's come to be that part of the video where we show the spines of the books coming up this week. And also a reminder to smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. All right. Let's continue with the overview. Next up is the X-Force Epic Collection Assault on Grey Malkin. This has been collected before in Marvel Premiere hardcovers, but not fully, not to what they have here with the mapping. Uh, it's also been collected in the X-Force Omnibus editions, though. In the... Uh, this is in the Cable and X... No, no, this is in... Yeah, no, it, it is in the Cable and X-Force. And then part of this is also collected in the Fatal Attractions oversized hardcover and trade paperbacks. But this is Volume 3 of X-Force, which of course is a continuation of New Mutants. Collecting X-Force 20 through 26, Annual Number 2, Cable 1 through 4, Deadpool the Circle Chase 1 through 4, and Nomad Number 20. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. This is the one that's getting the seal of approval. And if you're sitting here going, what the hell is wrong with me? Why didn't Ultraman? Why didn't Daredevil? Xanacenti? It's the beginning of DG? Chichester? Because this to me was my childhood. Like, not even childhood. I was in high school when these stories were coming out. And I couldn't wait for the next one. I cared about these characters. And a lot of it has to do with, of course, Fabian Niciesa. Writing the stories in here. I started to care about Deadpool. I only cared about Deadpool because of the way he looked in New Mutants number 98 and then in X-Force number 2. But by the time he was showing up and he got his own miniseries, I was in. I was like, oh, this dude is funny. There's something really off with him. And I really like him. And he made me care about characters <laughs> that, like, Feral. Like, I didn't give a crap about Feral before starting this run. I don't know. It's just something special about the his dialogue and his plot. And how each of these characters had their own moments. I mean, we just got Sam back. Um, and... It seems like they were able to shine. Now, you're going to see a lot of phenomenal artwork through here, if it's your cup of tea. And, of course, a lot of it has to do with Greg Capullo. When Greg Capullo was coming out of Quasar, they offered him this role or the job of X-Force. Who doesn't want to work on an X title? And then, of course, the Todd father saw him and pulled him over to Spawn. That's okay. Right after that, we got somebody else, Antonio Daniel, which we get to see his first X-Work here. But, yes, we have the new costume, so the team is now Cannonball leading them again because something has happened to Cable in the pages of the Executioner's Song. And this is in the aftermath. Uh, we have Sunspot, Richter, Shatterstar, Pharaoh, and Lila Cheney dropping in. Now, there are three characters that are missing. Where's Boomer? Boom Boom. She just recently changed her title. Uh, where's Siren? Where's Warpath? We'll get to them here in a second. Then we have... You know, we have all these little stories. The externals are dealing with their own thing. They're wondering, wait a minute, maybe we're not immortal. And that plays a big part in the next storyline. We have the character of Domino and Grizzly looking for clues, looking for some lady named Vanessa. And the gift. And this is after the Executioner's song. Cable left his team in case something happened to him. Grey Malkin. It's this big ship. And of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. is not going to let them take it with any kind of ease, GW Bridge makes his comeback. And eventually, you know, they get everything that they need. I love this, the final gift, which is the cover here. I don't care. People can make fun of the 90 staple guns. I freaking love that. It was so, look how badass they look right there. Seal of approval, baby. Look, that's a, that's a movie cover right there. And yes, the externals have captured their three friends while they were off having space adventures. Warpath, Boomer, Boomer. <laughs> that's her name i swear uh and siren have all been captured by the externals and they're trying to get sam over to their side meanwhile domino and grizzly are hunting down or they're looking for vanessa and vanessa's hanging out with her friend and of course vanessa is the copycat right she was the one that well in case you haven't read it that's all you need to know she was a copycat she has the power to change into somebody's appearance and here we have weapon prime with double trouble and yeti 
and Tiger Shark. Oh, Killjoy. I love that design, even though the colors are different. They actually made that... He's so badass, they made a toy of him, and he only appears, like, through these issues. Sluggo makes a first appearance here. Like, does anybody remember Sluggo? He later on appears in Deadpool. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of first appearances here. So we have Domino looking for Vanessa, finally finding her, but not before fighting Weapon Prime, which we'd seen before in earlier issues of... X-Force. Now they run into Deadpool, and of course, all that helps lead into the little mini-series. And again, Sam and his friends gotta go and find Warpath, Siren, and Boom Boom, or Boomer, sorry, and rescue them from the externals. Now, this is something I wish they had done differently, but that's okay. Um, and I'm not talking about the way that this is collected, or the way that this is scanned. That's, you know, this is the gold foil, if y'all remember that. What I wish they would have done, and they did the same thing in the Omnibus, is that I wish they had collected this after issue 25 of X-Force. Because in issue 25 of X-Force, there's something big that happens. And reading this after that would have been so much better. So what this is, is the Cable Ongoing series. Uh, we had Blood and Metal, which is a two-issue miniseries that did so well that Marvel was like, Hey, you know what, Fabian? Go ahead and tell your Cable story through an ongoing series. So collected in here, like I mentioned, is the first four issues of Cable. All of it written by Fabian Niciesa. And this shows us where Cable went after Executioner's Song. This shows us that he goes back to his future, that we revisit... You know, what happened to his wife? What happened to his kid? And we have a new villain in modern time named Sincere. I'm 100% being sincere about that. That's the dude's name, Sincere. We get to see his team that he worked with in the future, along with Kane. He took Kane with him to the future. Now, Art Tibert, or Thibert, I think it's Tibert, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't keep up a monthly schedule. He was more of an anchor back in the day, but this is his first walk in the park for pencils on a monthly basis he couldn't keep up a schedule so unfortunately after issue number four he ended up leaving the book uh we have a fall uh fill-in issues right here by paul smith and like klaus jansen uh brandon peterson doing some stuff ron Lim doing some stuff in the issue number three and then yeah art thibbert comes in and finishes out this issue number four with bart sears on the cover and there's actually some art assist in this one to rob liefeld and al milgram filling in some of the inks. This is a reunion of sorts of Cable coming back to the present and catching up with the Wild Pack. If you all remember the Six Pack, they go through different name changes. And then eventually leading into Fatal Attractions, which is, of course, the return of a classic X-Men villain. And oh, just beautiful, beautiful artwork here. And I do love the way that when Cable shows back up, he just looks so much younger than the older balding Cable. Uh, but I love the designs that Greg Capullo gave the new team. Now, the earlier issues are inked by Harry Candelario, who I really, really enjoyed his inks. Um, as of issue 24, though, we do have Richard Bennett, who actually did some pencils, too. We have his inks gracing Greg Capullo's pencils. And then uh, we do have Matt Broom doing a fill-in issue of issue 26 that introduces us to the mystery of Rainfire, which we will talk about later on in annual number three and then of course the post age of apocalypse and then we get to the deadpool the circle chase which made me the fan of deadpool i love this character back then and of course you know joe kelly uh went on to give him his own stories and i think people really enjoy that but i was out of comics at that time i really enjoyed this miniseries this really does a character dive or a, a deep dive in the character psyche of deadpool who he is who is wade wilson and we get to find, you know, his own supporting cast that even then, when Fabian was writing this, I was thinking, oh, this could definitely be an ongoing series. And it doesn't hurt that one of my favorite pencilers of all time, Joe Madureira, is the artist on this. And in here, we get some new uh, characters, too. We have Slayback, and of course, we have The Return of the Juggernaut and Black Tom Cassidy. And Sluggo comes back with Copycat right there. Uh, but we do have... Three new, or four new characters. Slayback, this guy right here. We've got yeah, Comcast with Makeshift and Rive. Those are the new characters. And they appear later on in the Cable and Deadpool series. Then after that series is over, we get one of the most important issues in the Summers line history. 
and that is X-Force Annual Number 2. Now, during this year of these annuals, um, Marvel was introducing new characters, and they came in a poly bag with a little trading card. And the new character is Adam X, the Extreme. And the artwork is in here is done by Antonio Daniel, who would later on become the ongoing artist on X-Force, who would later on also by the Todd Father gets pulled to draw Spawn, and later on be known as Tony Daniel, who has drawn Batman, has drawn uh, Spawn, so many issues of DC and Marvel Comics, and gets to write his own stuff these days. So, this is his first X work, and it's the first time I ever saw his artwork. And then we have the Nomad issue in here. Nomad number 20 is collected in here. But I have to talk about this first. Um, in the back of the annual, you have some pinups. And right here, this isn't really a pinup. This is actually the first page of the Executioner song when Peter David was writing the story and Larry Stroman was um, drawing X-Factor. However, he ended up leaving to go do the tribe at Image Comics and Jay Lee ended up taking over for the Executioner song. But that was the first page. And yes, we get the issue of Nova, uh, Nova, Nomad, Jack Monroe, that Fabian was writing at the time, but it features Grizzly and Domino and Weapon X Kane. And then in the back, oh my gosh, how long have I been talking about this book? It is my pick of the week. We have some artwork, some promotional art, the poster right here, the pinup. I thought this is the way Cable was going to look in the series, but instead he started looking like this, which... They would have kept the beard. The original art, they changed Siren right here from he Siren to, uh, do uh, not Domino, but Boom Boom when it was redrawn because Siren wasn't part of the story. And then the trading cards here that are mainly drawn by Greg Capullo, uh, but you also have Art Thiebert and Joe Mad and Mark Pasella, Jimmy Palmiotti. And this is the trading card that came inside of the poly bag. 496 pages. $44.99, and that is X-Force Assault on Grey Malkin. Last but certainly not least is the Fantastic Four by Dan Slott Hardcover Volume 4. So this one retails for $44.99. Let's go ahead and take it out of its dust jacket. Oh, in case you want to see what the flaps look like. Nice Mark Brooks piece right there. And of course, the Bride of Doom on the cover. All right, I guess goes without saying that uh, maybe some minor spoilers for some things that have happened previously, just in case. Don't want to spoil it for anybody. Okay, let's go ahead and crack it open. Collected in here are the Fantastic Four issues of Dan Slott's run from 2018, issues 31 through 39, the Road Trip one-shot, and Grim Noir. The book has 352 pages. Dan Slott, R.B. Silva... Luca Maresca, John Romina Jr., Nico Leon, Francesco Mana, and then Jerry Duggan and Ron Garney doing the Fantastic Four Grim Noir, and then Chris Cantwell with Felipe Andrede doing the Road Trip one-shot. And by now, the Fantastic Four are finally back home. They're back in New York. Uh, they're finally themselves. This is after the Empire crossover, so they are now the caretakers of Joven and Nikala, which are the young Scree, uh, the Cree and the young Scroll from the Empire storyline, and they're also the caretakers of some other kids because of the fantast or the Future Foundation, which is still playing a big part of this. Now Johnny Storm takes the center of this, Jonathan Storm, uh, because of his weakness for women, he ends up taking the center stage here, uh, where he has to you know, come face to face with his past. And I'm not just talking about his recent lady of Sky, but I'm talking about Lija, who comes back. And then this young lady, Victorious, who plays a big part in all of this. Uh, so yes, Lija tries to come back and take Johnny Storm, take him back where she, he belongs, which is with her. And that was a big Tom DeFalco story. Uh, and this is, of course, all taking place right before the celebration. And it's a really interesting celebration, which we'll get to here in a little bit. I found this really interesting. So Doom does decide, you know, to get married. And you can find out who he tries to marry here in a little bit. Uh, how he picks his best man is really awesome. Just wanted to showcase some of the artwork here between this wonderful sword fight between Doom and Reed Richards. 
and he picks the day <laughs> to get married is the anniversary date of Sue and Reed. Like he picks that day in particular to get married. And they point that out. They're like, dude, what are you doing? Now, I remember when I said Johnny Storm takes the center stage? Well, he certainly does <laughs> during this wedding. And you can find out exactly what happens during this wedding. Now, the next storyline that goes through here is the big celebration story, which is celebrating 60 years of Marvel's first family. And this is the cover, The Death in Four Dimensions, which is a really interesting story. It showcases the different Fantastic Fours from different timelines and all fighting the same villain. So you have Rama Tut, you have Kang the Conqueror, you have Immortus, you have the Centurion. Uh, there we go, the Scarlet Centurion. I wanted to showcase what the mock-up covers are like. These are really cool. They kind of are based on the covers that were around at the time, including the 30 years of x-men from 1963 to 1993 so this is them fighting the thunderbolts during this particular timeline and then of course who is scion and why are they being slaughtered by him so that's celebrating the 60 years of the fantastic four and we also have backup stories here retelling the origin of the fantastic four and then the next story arc which features the aftermath of what happened during the doom wedding and it focuses more on Johnny Storm and getting a visit from not just his friends in the Fantastic Four, but also your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man comes to kind of cheer him up. Because you know, he's wondering if he's any use to the Fantastic Four. There's an interesting trial that happens here that features the character of Jennifer Walter. And of course, that's the She-Hulk. But there's a couple of one-shots. This one-shot right here is the Jerry Duggan and Ron Garney one-shot. And this is the one that's called the Fantastic Four Grim Noir. And it's about Ben Grimm having a nightmare and seeing this image of this nightmare. So he asks Alicia Masters if she's able to sculpt this image. He takes it over to Reed and Reed's like, dude, I don't know who that is. I have no idea. So he ends up taking this sculpture over to Dr. Doom. The, like that, this next nightmare that he has, he sees this image. So he takes the sculpture, the head sculpture, over to Doctor Doom, and Doctor Doom's able to... Doctor Doom, not sorry, Doctor Doom. <laughs> Doctor Strange. So he takes it over to Doctor Strange. Did I say Doctor Doom earlier? Yeah, sorry. Doctor Strange. Wrong Doctor. Um, he takes it over to Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange is able to tell him who this is, because of course he can. Who is that that he keeps seeing in his dreams? Then we get the Fantastic Four road trip. This is the one by Christopher Cantwell and Felipe Andrede. And it is a trippy road trip when the family decides to take a break from superheroics and just take a road trip together. All the way in the back, we have variant covers, starting with the Hidden Gem variant by Jack Kirby and Joe Sinat here, the Scotty Young variant, the Mark Brooks variant, the Valerio Schetti variant, Ron Lim variant, and then... Other variants right here by Rob Liefeld and Nick Bradshaw, Javier Rodriguez, Peach Momoko. This is the John Romita Jr. variant. All of them, most of them rather, in splash pages and some of them in thumbnail pages. That's, I like that. So the book retails for $44.99 and again has 352 pages. It is sewn binding, not much of an eye. This one printed at the iMac printer. But honestly, I didn't see, and I was, I, I tend to look for this because it is printed in this, feels like the same paper stock they're using for the Omnis, maybe a little bit glossier. Um, they're very, very minimal bleed through coming. I, I mean, and I was looking for it, but I'm trying to be as thorough as I can when it comes to these overviews. Um, but yeah, there was very minimal bleed through and of course how the book lays over. So really no gutter loss when it comes to the spread pages. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. 
They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're planning on picking up. Did you miss out on the first printing of The Man Without Fear? Are you hoping for an omnibus edition of the Fantastic Four or a big hardcover collection of the Ultra Man series from Marvel? If you have any questions, leave them down below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. And a big thank you to our patrons for making videos like this possible. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.